Hello and welcome to the Corporate Facility Council's August webinar, The Stellar RFP Process, Building, Issuing, and Responding to RFPs, presented by Larry Morgan and Wayne Woodsell. I do want to let everyone know they have been muted for audio quality. If you do have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the question box, and we'll go over them at the end during the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. Um, I also like to let you know it's being recorded and archived of this webinar will be posted to the Corporate Facilities Council webpage. I would also encourage you to go there and check out other previous webinars you may have missed. Um, and so it's a great resource that I think you should utilize. At this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Wayne. Wayne, the floor is yours. Thank you, Joshua. So what I'd like to do is just do a quick little setup here to let everybody know uh, the framework that we're going to approach here. And the, the thing about RFPs is it's, there's two sides to it. There's the side from the FM perspective, uh, creating, producing, and sending out the RFPs. And then there's a side of the vendors responding to that. And I think it's a healthy exercise for uh, each side of that to, <laughs> to see the other side, what goes on on the other side of that, or what should go on on the other side of that. So if you're an FM, um, it's, I think it would be enlightening for you to see what happens once you throw that RFP over the fence to the vendor and how they deal with it or should deal with it and vice versa. So just wanted to give you that framework. Uh, Larry will be taking the FM perspective and after uh, Larry's done, I'll be taking the vendor perspective. So just wanted to give you that framework up front and feel free to type in questions into the chat box. Larry, uh, would you please enlighten us on how to create stellar RFPs? Yeah, great. Thanks. It's uh, it's an honor to be with my colleagues again. So a uh, little bit of history about me. I am a 30 year plus practicing FM. Started off in the business um, as a janitor, cleaning toilets on the loading dock on the graveyard shift. So yeah, I've heard all the stories about bottoms up and it's a crappy job. I, I got all that. So you can chuckle uh, if you want to. Um, one thing that I've um, come across met so many times, I can't even begin to uh, explain how many I, I've, I've, I've done uh, these kinds of presentations for. One thing that's always enlightening to me is um, being on the FM side of it is how do we get vendors to really perform um, according to what our specifications are, what our criteria are, what our success criteria are, et cetera, what matrixes are. Um, one thing that I hear constantly and have seen consistently throughout my career is that when we send out an RFP, what are we really asking for? What, what are we really trying to accomplish? So um, today my, uh, my presentation is about how to, how to really put together a stellar RFP so that people, both sides of the parties, can create that, that partnership and the relationship that sets itself up for success. So that's my... Uh, elevator pitch on this. So uh, obviously the first thing to do is when we talk about an RFP is really to define the objectives. I mean clearly define the objectives. Second thing is to design the methodology. How are we going to deliver this RFP? What are the framework? What are the details? And probably one of the most important pieces of this is the material really has to have a high degree of clarity and transparency. Um, for those of you on the FM side, you probably ran into this many, many times with your vendor said, well, we don't clearly understand what the expectations are. And on the vendor side is that we really don't understand or there's no clarity on what your expectations are, thus change orders, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of what the learning objectives of today are. Uh, next slide, please. So really starting off for, you know, what's what what is what exactly is the objective? What are we trying to accomplish? Um, Using SMART goals and objectives, we all heard that, so that, that's very easy to figure out. Um, what are the current pain points? Objectively, what are we trying to accomplish? One exercise that I, um, I'm a firm believer is in the wants and needs exercise. So you get the key stakeholders into a room, wherever that is, however many it is. Could be two, three, four, five, ten stakeholders, depending on the complexity of the RFP. Get them a posting notes, two colors red, green, pink, orange, doesn't matter what it is, and have them write down what the wants are and what the needs are. Let's use an example for a, a, a catering service or a pantry service. Um, coffee, as an example, because everybody's near and dear to that conversation. Okay, what do you really want? Well, we want coffee. Okay, great, I get that. And then the needs thing is, well, we want Starbucks, we want uh, Pete's, we want espresso, cappuccino machines, we want all these things, that's good. Okay, now you blend those two together, and really come up with 
the true outcome? What is it we're trying to accomplish here? What can we, what can we physically accomplish? It, it might be really cool that you want Starbucks, espresso, cappuccino machines, but do you understand the complexity of putting those machines into a building, the drainage, the power, uh, the overall operating costs, CapEx and OpEx costs at the end. So that really helps people um, understand and focus on what the objectives are. Another beautiful thing about doing that is it puts peer pressure on each other to really have that cross the table, the eye to eye discussion about is it, do we really need this or do we really want it? And if they really want it, um, what's the delta in cost? So that's, uh, I think it's a great exercise. The other one I'm firm believer is the Pareto principle. It's called the 80-20 rule. About 80% of your key stakeholders are on board. They get it, they understand it. Um, and they, you can have a general consensus about the 80-20 rule, the wants, needs kind of tie in. The other 20% are gonna be folks that may or may not be engaged at that level. They may have unreasonable expectations, so you can kind of carve those out. It's called Pareto Principle, 80-20 rule. So focus your 80% of your energy efforts on this RFP on 80% of the positive outcomes. 20% of the things are gonna happen. I get it. There's gonna be uh, pieces of the puzzle that won't fit, and we don't know where that's gonna fit, either today, tomorrow, or in the, in the long term. Um, but again, don't focus 80% of your effort on this RFP on 20% of the issue Pareto Principle. Another thing is from the objective is, you know, keep keep it brief. We we don't want to read 50 pages of uh, why we should have this versus that. Keep it simple. Absolutely keep it simple. And also one of the big things I'm a massive believer in is keep it in the language of the receiver. Uh, think of yourself, reverse roles. Think of yourself in the vendor's position. When you send out the RFP, do they really understand it? Is it clear what the expectations are? Um, I'm also a firm believer in partnering with your vendors up front. Uh, if you already have an established, uh, let's say, a general contractor that's going to put the coffee machines in, how about getting them in their room first and say, what's it going to take to do this? Um, give us some rough draft expectations, et cetera, et cetera. So keep it in the language of the receiver. Uh, another one is, is this what we're trying to do? Is this in alignment with any corporate objectives? Um, let's say, for instance, on the, the coffee situation. It may be an HR issue from an attraction retention perspective. Then if it is, then what is that objective? Uh, we want to retain employees. We have employee surveys that say we want this or we need that and we believe we can execute it. So uh, again, make sure that's in line with whatever corporate objective you're trying to get. Uh, and next, next step is turn all those ideas into action. So next slide, please. So how are you going to, what's the methodology? How are you going to deliver this thing? And I know that there's going to be some cringe and some giggles in the background, but right now procurement's your best friend. And I say, yeah, really. Um, procurement in the, in the most organizations now have a really driving role in putting together the RFPs, delivering the RFPs to the vendors, getting the RFPs back, executing the contracts. And again, this I'm using broad brushes on this because not every organization is the same, but for the most part, the reason why procurement needs to be involved now is because once an RFP is sent out, it becomes part of a legal document. When the contracts are signed, contracts are legal documents, they always refer back to the RFP as part of the scope of services. So procurement should be your best friend right now. Uh, I am a massive believer in performance contracting versus prescriptive contracting. So traditionally, we use prescriptive contracting. We tell somebody how to do it. Well, I don't know about you, but my experience is that sets itself up for failure or for some disconnects along the line. Example, in a landscaping contract, again, I'm keeping it simple. These people should be subject matter experts in landscaping. So why would we tell the landscape contractor how to mow the lawn, how to trim the trees, how to plant the plants? Are you seriously considering that on a Monday morning, if the landscape company mowed your 10 hectares of lawn, on Monday morning, you're gonna go out with a ruler and measure the lawn because in the prescriptive contract, it says mow the lawn to one and three quarters inches high. Who's gonna go out there with a ruler and measure the lawn at one and, one and three quarters inches? I can tell you candidly that if I came to work early Monday morning and one of my senior facility staff was out there with a the ruler measuring the lawn, 
they probably wouldn't be working for me too long because they are not doing the right thing. They're doing things right. So how about this simple statement? I, again, keeping it simple. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Landscape Vendor, if it's green, mow or trim it. If it's brown, water it or replace it. That's keeping it simple. They're subject matter experts in this, so they should be. So I don't know, and I'm not a horticulturist, so I wouldn't know, or an arborist, I wouldn't know what kind, I mean, I know what kind of tree it is. It's, say it's an elm tree, but I don't know what kind of pruning schedule it needs. I don't know what kind of fertilizer schedule it needs. I don't know what kind of pesticides it can and can't take. I don't know where we should plant it. I do know that a lot of our issues in facilities management, you plant trees next to sidewalks, and then two years later, you've got sidewalk lifts, and now you're doing construction on the sidewalk. So let the vendors, uh, do what they need to do that's their job so they're subject matter experts again that's pretty simple another example is if you went and bought a car some of the things you look for in cars are safety rating you don't know how the airbags blow up you don't know how the safety belts catch when it hits something um another thing is miles per gallon if you're driving a a, a petrol powered car you look for miles per gallon that's just that's performance it's not prescriptive so think about these performance versus prescriptive issues in your day-to-day -day life and then how they would apply to your work life. I can guarantee you that um, going to performance contracting for me and others who I've counseled on this and helped do this has proven to be wildly successful, not only for the FM provider, but also for the FM services team. They're not dealing with 80 pages of documentation. Another example would be cleaning. Clean it the way it's supposed to clean. Would you spend, uh, just question, would you spend 25 cents per square foot to clean the loading dock and 25 cents per square foot to clean the executive or customer facing space? If you are, you're probably spending the wrong, the right money in the wrong places. So another simple example is clean the executive space the way it's supposed to be cleaned as an executive space is no smudge, no dirt, no scuff, no whatever that is. And the loading dock is never going to be as clean as the executive space. So why tell the janitorial company to clean the loading dock the same as you would the executive space? Better value. All this, frankly, is around the highest value. How can you get the highest value from the dollars you're spending? How can the vendor perform at its highest value level according to how they believe things should happen? And this is a partnership. Last part of that is develop a scoring metrics. Uh, Wayne, next slide, I think, has the scoring metrics on it. Uh, there's a scoring metrics on here, I think, or did we take that out? Oh, I, I, we took that out, yeah. Okay, great. So anyway, a scoring metrics really kind of puts the criteria down, keeps it neutral, um, all things being equal, uh, the weighting and rating schedules. So if you have five criteria on the selection side of it, and they, all, they must all equal to 100%, so the weight and rate gives you uh, a, a metrics that helps even the playing field across the board. So um, if you're interested in that, I'll, I'll make sure that I send a sample of a scoring metrics over to Josh and he can post it. Okay, next slide, please. So again, develop the framework. Um, what's the company's overview and capacity to perform? I'm very interested in their capacity to performance because a lot of things that we do in the FM service business on the vendor side and on the FM side um, is scalable. Can you scale up and can you scale down? Can you handle massive events? Let's say if you're in a corporate environment and there's a 1500 person event on Friday, you need additional janitorial services to make sure that the garbage cans are empty and recycles taken out. Can you scale up? I'm very interested in how they can scale up and scale down. Explain your technical capabilities. Really tell me what it is that you can do. Any kind of information on unique solutions? Um, example, if you have a, um, a floor care company and you have marble or terrazzo in your lobbies, what's a unique solution they can provide you that, that you probably don't know um, that would keep that floor shiny, keep it maintenance free, but also keep it slip resistant? So what are their unique solutions? Definitely put together some detailed timeline and milestones. Um, here's one that's a pet peeve of mine and you probably all ran into this. RFPs due back Friday, April 1st, five o'clock in electronic format. Come Tuesday, you get a box delivered by shipper receiving, a box full of binders, 
with the vendor's proposal in it with 30 pages of their corporate dissertation how cool they are in their history going back to 1822 i am not interested in all of that i want to know what you're going to do for me today so if they're if they're not even um, capable of delivering the rfp the way that you have prescribed it to be on time in electronic format um, it's an automatic dump for me and I will call them and say thank you but you've been disqualified because you can even follow the simplest directions again I'm being a little crass about it and it's a much more delicate conversation we have that but that's the bottom line the other one is client references this this is something that um, I preach in my all my FMP classes and other classes and when I do consultation work is I am pardon the French I am not interested in some claim to fame client reference yes xyz companies the greatest things since sliced white bread same with your resumes when they ask for references what are they asking for what do they expect what do you expect to get on the client references i'm much more interested in error recovery the reason why is we all make mistakes something happens i get it but how did you recover from it for example on the vendor side tell us about a time you lost a client and what happened and what did you learn from it? So now you can apply the error recovery to um, your RFP solutions. That is much more interesting to me because when it does happen, I wanna know how you fix it. Not a glowing resume of, they're the greatest thing that ever happened to landscaping. Doesn't tell me anything about how they operate. Next one is how do you treat your people? What's your employee engagement schedule? What's your training? What's your diversity? How many women do you have in, ma in senior management? Um, what's your employee turnover? I'm interested in that. I've given some examples before of um, a location where I had where the janitorial and security service turnover was the churn in our in our world was 90% annually. That's ridiculous. And the reason why is because the company that we had contracted out was not paying fair living wages, wherever the geog geography was in this case happened to be Vancouver. So anytime that somebody found another job for a quarter more an hour, they would change. There was times when I was up there um, on a Monday and there would be the security person at the front desk and I would come back in the office on Tuesday and it'd be somebody different. And I started questioning what, what's, what is this issue? And it was because they weren't paying fair living wages. So definitely in your RFP, ask, ask uh, very specific questions about how they treat their employees. What's their training schedule um, along those lines? You don't want turnover. Turnover is death to a contract. Any kind of products and services quote makes sense, but in the language of the receiver and in the language of you, in, ask them specifically what their markups are. Um, you'd be surprised at how many solutions that are out there where uh, it would seem at base cost to be reasonable, but then you start peeling them back to onions and look at all their markups, 35% of this, 20% of that, 15% of that, and that, at the end of the day, that stuff really starts adding up. So get clarity on the product and services quote. Again, the selection scoring system that I mentioned earlier helps keep a level playing field, delivered to that, to deliver to them up front as well to say, this is how you are going to be scored and how you're going to be selected. So there's no mystery there. Next slide, please. So how are you going to deliver it? Again, clarity and transparency is, is critically important in the language of the receiver so that they can translate that information back to you in the language of you as the receiver. What's the submission for the deadlines? How do you want your um, RFPs delivered? Paper or electronics? I'm not a big believer in paper because if I have five vendors that are supplying RFPs, and I get five binders, that means I've got to deal with five binders full of paperwork that I'm just not interested in dealing with. Um, when is the RFI due? How are you gonna respond to it? Are you gonna respond in like kind? If there's some confidential information that only you wanna only ask one specific vendor, make sure that information is actually really confidential. That keeps a level playing field as well too. Going back to earlier, if you have a clear and transparent RFP, you probably should have a very limited amount of RFIs. There may be some simple things that come back, but in my example, uh, if you start getting two or three pages or 20 or 30 questions coming back to you from an RFI perspective, you probably haven't clearly and transparently outlined what it is you're trying to accomplish. I'm definitely interested 
in the vendors delivering to me any codes of conduct, any policies, including environmental policies. I want to know how their people, how can I expect their people to behave when on site? And I know it sounds, well, yeah, that makes sense. But do they need to be in uniform? Do they need to speak English? Do they, you know, what is their code of conduct? Um, what is their um, escalations, things along those lines? And what are their environmental policies? How are they dealing with hazardous material? Uh, again, vendor specific. Well, let's use a landscape company. They have uh, a lot of hazardous materials that they use, the gas for the lawnmowers, fertilizers, oil, et cetera. How they deal with hazardous material. Um, we are not a hazardous material storage facility, so it's very specific in RFPs that no hazardous material will be stored on site. You bring it, you take it. It's that simple. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, that was it, Larry. Okay, so that's um, kind of my elevator pitch on performance contracting. Again, I've seen this in place. Uh, I've, I've done a lot of work around performance contracting. I've written white papers on it. I published it in, in trade magazines. Uh, by and large, if people understand it and adapt it um, at a simple scale, I mean, obviously, you want to, if you're not doing it already, you probably want to pick something a little bit easier to understand for everybody. My experience and others' experience has told me that this is the highest value way that you can deliver and deal with an RFP. It creates a partnership, which is really where we should be. It's not the um, FM vendor, boss, employee uh, relationship anymore. It's about partnerships. I'm interested in having a partner that helps me be successful so that they can be successful, so that the organization can be successful. Actually, both organizations could be successful in long-term relationships. So I appreciate the time. Um, if there's any questions around that, I guess you can throw them up in the chat room, or otherwise we'll just turn it over to Wayne. Thanks, Larry. Yeah, and if, if every, anybody has any questions, uh, type them in, and at the end, Joshua will we'll sort through them, and, uh, and we can go through those those questions. <laughs> Um, and also, if so, I can just jump in real quick, I forgot to mention, if you want a um, PDF copy of this PowerPoint, you can download it now on the control panel under handouts. Um, sorry to interrupt, I just forgot to do that in the opening. Go ahead, Wayne, sorry. Oh, thanks, thanks, Joshua, great, that's great. And that is important too, because I'm gonna be going through a checklist here, uh, so don't feel like you have to write everything down. I've included the checklist in that PDF. So basically, let's look at it this way. Um, you know. Larry and his team just created this great RFP and sent it out, and now I'm dealing with that RFP uh, uh, from a vendor perspective. So keep that in mind, but also keep in mind that um, many times uh, as an associate, I receive RFPs that uh, vary in degree of how much it adheres to what Larry just, just talked about. Um, in some cases, in many cases even, I receive what I would call an abomination of an RFP where I look at it and I say, geez, if they would have just asked me how to construct this RFP, I could have helped them procure a better service. Um, so I'd like to show you what happens when we receive it. There's really, you know, a lot of this is targeted toward the associates in our midst uh, to give them some tools how to respond to these. But uh, take a look as an FM and, and, and see the process we go through. So first is there's a, a pre-RFP phase. There's the reception when we receive the RFP, then preparing the RFP response, then submitting the RFP, and then dealing with the decision. Those are the five phases that we deal with as an associate member. So let's talk about the, each of these phases and the goal of each one. Well, in the pre-RFP phase, the goal is to prevent the RFP and sell direct. That's my goal as an associate member. And frankly, I'm dealing you know, a lot more with FMs that tell me, hey, if this thing isn't over 500 grand, I'm not, I'm not putting it out for an RFP. It's not worth our time. Um, especially you know, some of the areas in Silicon Valley where we do business, it's just not worth their time. And, and they would rather vet the vendors themselves through the FM team and just select through that process rather than a formal RFP. If you can prevent the RFP, that's what you wanna do. There's really a couple of things as part of this pre-RFP phase that you should be doing as, a, as an associate member and ways that as an FM member, you can help us deliver a better service. First is you gotta understand the client's industry. You can't sell this to an industry you don't understand. It, uh, the, uh, uh, a university is different than uh, dealing with a corporate facility. In some cases, in some cases it's similar, like Facebook. Uh, who is the incumbent? You get to understand you know, who's there already doing the work. When does their contract expire? So you can start planning you know, to, to reach out and say, hey, I understand your contract is expiring. Is there an RFP, et cetera? 
uh, and then contact the procurement department. Now, I have an asterisk here that says only after contacting the FM or if the FM is unresponsive. Now, UFMs here on, on the call, if we've been trying to get a hold of you, as sub, you know, we're subject matter experts, we believe we can help you with X service, and you're not responding to our calls or emails or entreaties you know, for a long period of time, our next best bet is to reach out to your procurement department and say, hey, next time you guys go out to bid for whatever it is, landscaping, we'd like to be on that RFP. Um, we'd much rather go through you to get there, but unfortunately, if we're not getting any feedback from you, that's really our only other avenue into your organization to, to, to get in front of you. Um, and sometimes uh, FMs don't like that. So that's why I have my little asterisk there. Uh, the other thing is develop personal relationships. Um, find out, and this is why ISMA is so great, you know, what are the, the facility managers or property managers hot button issues? Are they having problems with their incum incumbent? Try to uncover what those issues are. Offer to assist with the scope. Maybe we can help you tighten that up or, or, or write a scope for your RFP. Get to, get to know those people. When I say personal relationships, I'm not talking about those phony, you know, personal relationships uh, that, that, that can sometimes happen in business. I'm talking about, you know, really get to know someone and, and, and as a subject matter expert, find a way to help them with their problems. And do you have any networking partners that are already doing work with this company? So if you can do some of those things to avoid the RFP, great. If you can't, then you've got to deal with the RFP. And as soon as you receive that RFP, your number one goal here is advanced planning. So I'm an associate, I receive this email or package or whatever it is, I now have to start planning. So you have to designate your single point of contact and your prop and your, sorry, not property manager, your project manager role. Who is going to lead this? Who is going to take point in your organization? The very first thing you need to do is to read and highlight the RFP with a highlighter, print it out, or if you have an electronic way to do this, highlight those key items that might be next actions and, and, and important information in that RFP. Go through it with a fine-tooth comb. Really understand the scope of this RFP. What are the due dates and timeline? And also, what time zone? There are a lot of times I've seen in the past, I've done a lot of GSA contracting, where you're submitting proposals all over the country, and if it's due at 9 a.m., is that 9 a.m. East Coast or Pacific? Important to understand that. And then what's the submission type? Uh, hard copy, email, et cetera? Is it a reverse auction? Understand all of that stuff in that first read-through. And then I highly recommend you keep an organized filing system um, when you receive these documents on your hard drive. You have the original docs you receive, then have another folder for the response. So you're drafting and producing your responses. And then for any addendums, and addendums are things that come out on the RFP, changes to it, to scope, et cetera. Keep all of those very organized because with paper flying back and forth or, or files back and forth on the computer, <clears throat> um, this stuff can get jumbled and mixed up and you forget what iteration you're at and which, which file to edit, keep them organized. Now here's the most important thing. You have a go or no go decision about that RFP. So that project manager that read through everything summarizes the, the, the opportunity and presents it to a decision team. Don't make that decision team huge. You don't want a, 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 a large group of people. You want to have the smallest group possible to say, okay, here's the opportunity. Here's what it entails. Here's the, the level of, uh, of commitment we're going to have to have in terms of visiting sites, uh, cost to do that, et cetera, and then make that decision. Now, some people wait until after the site walk. Uh, if there is a site walk to go uh, look at this to make that decision. But uh, it's interesting, you know, I've had conversations with people like Larry and, 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 and others who uh, consistently may have uh, heard of companies uh, using vendors as a third bid. They're never going to give them business. They bring them in and they go through this big exercise and eventually the company says, I'm not participating in your stuff. I never get anything. You ask me to throw, throw a bid at it. I know I'm just your third bid for, for procurement. So you can burn some vendors by um, consistently asking them for, uh, to participate, but never really having the intent to give them anything or to, or to award them anything. So be, be aware that we have to make a decision on cost. Is it worth it? If we know we have a competitor who consistently lowballs and, and delivers you know, subpar work, but knows the price only decision, why are we gonna spend all of that money participating in your RFP? if we know there's not a chance we're going to get it. What's the point? So that's a decision you have to make and turn down those RFPs because there's an opportunity cost to not pursuing other business. If you're mired down in an RFP, you really don't think you have a chance of winning. 
and then planning. So here's the thing is, is on both sides of us, FM and, and on uh, the associate side, and this is if anybody's taken my uh, surfing chaos class, you understand that you don't want to do all this at the 11th hour. When you read through that RFP, know what the milestones are, when things are due, and not only that, in your own team, when, what tasks do they need to do? You can't do this alone in most cases. You need, you know, you need Jenny in, in, in HR, you need Juan in operations, you need Fred in, in, in this department and Susie in that department to give you information so you can respond to this RFP. Assign those tasks, but don't tell them what the due dates are in reality bump them up a week or two <laughs> I say if it's due on Thursday at two tell them it's due the previous Monday at one Get, build buffers in because I, I will tell you I've been at 1159 <laughs> the, you know that, that 11th hour waiting for someone on my team to send me a piece of information that needs to go into an RFP I'm, I'm hyperventilating in front of the computer waiting to send so assign those tests early with a time buffer to your team and send them reminders hey Fred, this is due uh, in three days. Just want to check in. How are you doing on this? And then site walks. First thing is you got to watch for signs of a farce. Um, and I, I'll, so my FM friends out there, um, I'll tell you a story. I, I once showed up at a, a, an RFP we were invited to. Um, a company said, hey, uh, we have an opportunity. Uh, would you like to get in on this? And we thought it was a real opportunity. And we're standing waiting in the lobby uh, for this site walk to begin. And I see the FM walk out. And the FM walks over to our competitor and gives him a big old bear hug and, and practically gives him a, a, a pat on the rear end. <laughs> it was very intimate. And, uh, and I just looked at my team. I said, oh, no. And, and you just feel that pit in your stomach that you're the third bid. Um, so you, you really got to watch for that stuff. And that might inform your, your go, no go decision as well. What are the number of competitors? Is this a, you know, a gaggle? Are you walking through with 20 people, uh, 20 different companies? Understand what that is and who are the competitors because you want to feed that back to your decision team also and say, hey, here's who I saw was there. And like, oh, that's Tony from uh, Smith Company. They're, they're low ballers. We're, you know, and it's a price only thing. Forget about it. And then questions. So here's the thing. When you're walking through FM, you know, people, you're taking the site walk, you say, are there any questions? We might have questions, but unfortunately, we might be giving up an advantage competitively if we ask that question. And you are usually under obligation to share all those questions with everybody, uh, especially if we ask them through email. But if we ask them in front of the team and we see something with our eye, we say, hey, we should bring this up in the RFP. We might not share that as a strategic advantage in front of those people. So I'm just kind of pulling back the veil and letting you know that that happens. We might see something there and we'd love to ask that question and get an answer. But now everybody's going to be thinking about that and saying, hey, that's a great idea. And we lose an advantage. So just getting a, an idea of how we think. So don't share that advantage. And then you have to be respectful of the cone of silence. There comes a point in every RFP process where, whether it's formal or informal, where you don't want to put your FM partner in a bad spot by uh, asking them questions that theoretically you shouldn't be talking to them at that point in time. So a lot of RFPs are very formal about that, that it has to be submitted this way, et cetera. Some are still not formal. I even my best friends who were, I mean, most of my best friends are in, in IFMA anyway, I still wouldn't call them up and say, hey, what's the deal here with this? Or, hey, what do you think about this? Because I never want to put them in that position. So be respectful of, of the cone of silence. And I quick word about by IFMA. Um, this is an initiative that um, I started with the IFMA Sacramento chapter um, many years ago. And uh, I just would like to make a quick pitch here and say that FM partners, if the first place you're, you're going to isn't within your own chapter or IFMA through a CSP or through a sponsor or looking to see who's, who's in your own chapter, um, you're missing out. Um, not only that, is, is we support the chapter as associate members. And, you know, I think you're going to get a higher level of quality of service from a long-term member because they're going to have to look you in the eye at the next chapter meeting um, and, and, and they know they don't want to get a bad rep around the chapter. Uh, I would just encourage you when you are going out, uh, let's see, whether it's elevator service, look in your chapter. You know, if there's three elevator vendors in your chapter, make sure they're on the list for the RFP or call them up and say, hey, we're going out to RFP in six months. Just wanted to let you know, contact, you know, Fred in procurement. So I just encourage you to, 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 to buy IFMA. So third step. So you, 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 you haven't averted the RFP. It's come, it's come to you. You've reviewed it. 
and you've decided you're going to pursue it. You're, you're, it's a go, okay? So what's the our goal here? To get shortlisted or selected for that? So you either get shortlisted as a potential winner or the winner. So in your, in your preparation for response, you have to understand what is the format? And Larry kind of gave us a couple of different, you know, the, the two dominant, prescriptive and, and, and performance-based. What is the response? Is it precise? Does it have to be in this order, answering it this way, in this font? You have to understand all that. Or is it more of a free-form essay? And we get some of those still sometimes or, or pieces of them that are like that. My big tip here is don't bury the lead. Less is more. I, I worked for a company, and this is no exaggeration, okay? I worked for a company once that their short form uh, proposal, just a proposal, not even an RFP response, was 60 pages, six zero pages. And we tried to trim that down to eight, and, and uh, a few of us uh, at the company, and eventually were, were quashed, and it went back up to 60. RFP responses routinely were around 330 pages. And this was for a basic cleaning, a floor cleaning contract. And the company was including their entire employee handbook in the response and things like that. And I would talk to these FMs and they would say, why did you send me all of this stuff? It was hard to get to what I wanted. Why didn't you just give me what I wanted? So less is more. Answer the questions they have specifically. And understand what that judging criteria will be. So Larry does does a great uh, justice by telling the vendors and everybody involved, here's the rubric. Here's how we're going to judge this. If you didn't get that rubric or, or judging criteria in the RFP, make that one of your questions. How, how, what will your process be for choosing a vendor? And they might not share that with you. They might, they might not. They might not even know. And they might be winging it themselves internally as an FM. But if they say, yeah, we really want somebody that can scale, or we really want somebody that has X, or somebody that's got expertise in green, or whatever it is. So who is judging? So make it easy. <laughs> make it easy for them. Answer the questions they have. Don't bury it six lines down in the paragraph. You know, what is, you know, what is your uh, environmental policy, right? Right at the top of the front, we are committed to X, put a number there, or whatever it is that you can put hooks in right at the beginning. Don't bury it and make the person who's judging this or team have to dig for the answer. And don't talk in abstract business speak. Keep it very, like Larry said, put the RFP out in the language of the receiver. Well, the same thing is true for us. As subject matter experts, we can talk in crazy language sometimes about our industries. Forget all that and make it simple and, and concrete and not abstract. Call outs are a great way to do that. So. If you've got value adds, and that's what you SMs want to see, you're like, okay, here's the answers. Yeah, they can do this. But what, what, what's, what's the special stuff this company has? Or what, how can I get best value? Call it out. Say, here's a best value item number one. All right? Show what that is and demonstrate your subject matter expertise. We're not talking about you saying, yes, we have this. Yes, we answered section 8.1. Yes, we have this. And demonstrate how you, in this particular field, are a subject matter expert and therefore a potential partner, like Larry is saying, to enter into a relationship. And what are your differentiators and comparisons? Well, how are you similar? How are you different from people in, in your industry? What, what, what makes you different? Are you a national company or a local company? Um, are you, do you have the ability to scale up and, up and down, et cetera? And here's the key. So this is really, you know, I, I, this is an important point here, this next one. In your RFP response, you want to create a way to give flexibility and options and alternatives to the people making decisions. You know, in other words, you want to give judges a way out. If you come in and your price might be a little higher, but yet you've got all these value adds and all these other things, that's something if the FM says, gosh, this company, you know, Wayne's company really gets it. They understand. I want them in here. They get it. Um, I, I know that, but their price is a little higher. You want to give them some meat on the bone so that when they argue for you, that they can say, yes, their price is higher, but look at all these value adds. You want to put those things in there and give the FM the ability to go to bat for you if they really want you in that, uh, based on your RFP response. So give, find ways to offer that. Pricing. So here's the thing, uh, guys, you know, if you, <laughs> you send us these RFPs and we have to decide how we're going to respond back with pricing. And here's a few of the ways that, or options that, that we have to respond sometimes. 
uh, and, and you see this, like this, this first one you see a lot in the janitorial industry, the low ball and then upsell after, because everybody's going to low ball it. You know you're going to get in there. And if, if, if only sometimes uh, some of our FM partners would just do the math and calculate um, what's being, what's in the scope versus what's being charged and then saying, wait a minute, how could they do this unless they're paying their people $4 an hour? <laughs> you know, sometimes you see that, but the low ball is I'm going to nickel and dime you after we sign this contract to start making profit on this thing, or I'm going to cut corners. So that's the low ball and then upsell after. And then there's the price exactly what was spent. Okay. This is what you want. Okay. This is exactly what I'm pricing back. Now, you know what, what might happen. We win it, and then you want some changes. Well, then it's change order time. But then there's also the price, what they really need. Now, some of you put in your RFPs, which is great. Um, if you see anything that you would do differently, let us know what that is and, and offer us an alternative here. That's a great thing to put in your RFPs because if you haven't done due diligence on the front end uh, with vendors and gotten their input, um, you might produce an RFP that's lackluster, and, and I look at it and say, gosh, if only they would have added this, 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 and this, they probably would have gotten a better uh, a response. So price what they need. If you're a subject matter expert, give them that alternative. Even if they don't ask for it, I think you should put that in there. And then here's the other one. Do you price for negotiation rounds? I deal with a lot of companies that I know from past experience, I'm going to give them a price, and they're going to come back to me once or twice again and ask me to drop my price. So what do you do as a vendor? Do you, as a vendor, knowing that, do you price it a little higher, knowing you're probably going to get shortlisted, and, and then drop it down to your real price? See, this, this, this is gamesmanship and playing around and sometimes, and procurement does drive a lot of this. Is that your best price? Come back to us with your best price. Uh, we got some, you know, we really like you. Come back with your best price. So this, is, this gets a little weird here. You know, do you, re, do you stand your ground and say, no, we, we gave you our best price for the scope that you had in here, um, and this is what it is? Or do you play the game? And this is a tough call sometimes because if the company you're dealing with plays the game um, and they're expecting a game to be played, sometimes you have no alternative but to play that game. And it feels kind of yucky to have to do that sometimes. But if you know Company X, they always go through two rounds of, of, of beating people up. Is that, are you, are you going to really give them your lowest price up front? So that, that, that's something to think about, guys. And then references, like Larry was saying, uh, what I like is, is minimizing the risk of change. <laughs> you know, uh, if, if you've got an incumbent that you, know, you kind of like but, but don't like, here's some things you don't, you want to know that if I'm going to change this vendor, uh, that, you know, the, the bottom's not going to fall out on everything. Uh, so your references should minimize the risk of change. Um, uh, I do like Larry's error recovery, and, and I get that question a lot where um, to give us a contact to, of a client you lost in the past, you know, X period of time and, and why. So I do like that um, idea, but we still get asked, asked that question um, of clients, similar clients, type, size, and area. The other thing is if you have big client names, um, sometimes uh, that can bite you. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're, you know, uh, Coke Industries or Google or some major company is your client and you're bidding for a, a, a smaller company that maybe is, you know, kind of is the, the anti-Google company uh, saying, hey, we do this. That company's going to say, well, we're nothing like that or we don't, we do things differently here. That might be uh, a, a bad thing. You want to be able to pick your references uh, in a way that are going to inspire the person reading it. But um the error recovery one, I do think I would love to see that included more because we've learned a lot. And subject matter experts don't get to be subject matter experts without learning along the way, making mistakes, and adapting. So review. Share the draft with your team. You wrote it up. Run it by your team. Keep the review team small. You don't want to have a lot of people, too many hands in the, in the, in the pot. And then plan buffer before due day. So it's that review should occur with plenty of days out before it's actually due enough time for rewrites and changes. Don't do it the day before or day of, please. And then number four, RFP submission. So what's your goal here? Get a completed package and on-time delivery. An on-time submission means it should already be on your calendar when the thing is due and when you're going to send it out to account for travel time, uh, time zones, et cetera. Is there sh ship time? If, you're sh if they request a document, You've got to account for that ship time. So now, here's the thing. You submit it early if done. Now, UFM partners should understand that 
We have internal debates about that as associate members. We might be done a week before. Do we want to send that thing out? Well, there might be addendums that come out toward the end, so we might want to wait. Or do we say, do we worry if we submit it early that somebody's going to get a last look at the bids? Now, I know no, none of the great people on this call would do that, but uh, there are people out there who might do that. So we worry about that. We worry about somebody you know, on, on your team or procurement who may be leaking the information sometimes. So that's an internal debate that we have. Um, do you wait until the 11th hour, right until the due time, and then submit so there's no chance for that? So that's a, that's a question you need to answer, how safe you feel with the confidentiality of your response. And uh, you know, in most cases, I, I do feel confident, uh, but there's sometimes where you just get the heebie-jeebies on your site walks where you realize you might be in a, in a, in a farce. Don't wait until the last minute uh, um, to, to, to submit and you know, put everything to, to, together. Everything should be done in advance. And here's the thing, if it's an email, request read and delivery receipts. And, and save those in your response folder. You ask for it because you, you, if it's due on Wednesday at noon, you want to send a delivery receipt and read receipts. So if there's any question that you didn't submit it on time, you can pull up that receipt to say, yes, it was sent, and I saw that it went through to your server. So shenanigans. <laughs> Um, the things to watch out for, I mentioned, were last looks. That's where the RFPs are kind of, uh, the person, the contact, procurement, whoever really wants, uh, is told what the price to meet is. Uh, you got to, if you sense that, you've got to be careful. And, and unfortunately, there's not much you can do, but just be aware that that does happen in some cases. Are you just a third bid? Were you just, if you got the call, hey, would you like to participate in this sourcing event? And you knew nothing about it, hadn't you know, talked to the client about it in advance, chances are you're a third bid. And the chances of you winning that are usually very slim. Usually it's the incumbent they want to get out of the, of the, of the, the contract and the, the vendor they really want, number two, and then you to satisfy the third bid. So be aware that that might be the case. And ask questions about that. Uh, their friend is a competitor. I mean, that's, something to be aware of. You do run into that sometimes where, where you know this person is very tight with company X, they grew up together, uh, et cetera. Um, you might, that might be a disadvantage to you. Technicalities, are they writing the, the RFP in such a way that they're, they're it, 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 it raises the hair on the back of your neck that there are so many ways out for them not to choose you that it seems like it's already pre-written to choose another vendor. Be aware of that. And then here's my favorite one, the apples to helicopters pricing. And we always hear the term, hey, we really structured this RFP to get apples to apples pricing because you've gotten apples to oranges in the past. Well, many times I get RFPs back and I say, they're, they're going to get apples to helicopters pricing. It's not even going to be the same thing, what, the, the structure, the way they're asking for this. And it could also be that your incumbent has information and data about the, the contract that no one else has. Now that's a strategic advantage. But if you go to your incumbent and say, hey, can you send me, um, let's say they're a, a, they do their service based on square footage, okay, of what they're servicing and say, hey, what, what is the square footage of this thing you're, you're doing here? And the vendor gives the square footage. Are you sure the square footage they're giving you is accurate? Or are they overstating the square footage so that when the other respondents respond to that square footage you posted, their price is going to be higher? Mmm. Aha. Uh -huh. See? So this is one of those things where if you if you really got to think about it, if you really want apples to apples, that bid has to be structured and uh pure to deliver that. And then lastly, the RFP decision. The goal here is to learn and improve. So there's a few decision types that happen out there and and you know, the short list usually will lead to either more presentations where you go and, and please, at these presentations it's usually best to listen more and talk less as, as associate. I want to hear from the FM what, what their concerns are, um, how, you know, what did they not get from the RFP, what additional info they need. It's not a way to just go up and regurgitate your company policies uh, to them. It, it's, it's an opportunity to listen. And then sometimes they might ask for performance testing. Hey, can you do this here? We were comparing you against the other two shortlisted people. So be prepared to, to handle that kind of decision. The other might be a negotiation I mentioned early, earlier, where you're going to have to go back and forth with that. But as a subject matter expert, I highly recommend you stand your ground and say, yes, we can lower the price if we change this frequency here to quarterly instead of bi uh, you know, bimonthly. 
et cetera. Find ways to justify how you can do a price uh, decrease and negotiate, but not just say, hey, you know, well, we gave you, uh, you know, 22 cents a foot, but you asked us to lower it. So how does 20 cents a foot sound? Well, that's kind of cheesy. Why didn't you just give me the 20 cents a foot at the beginning? How are you justifying that difference? So justify your differences in the, in the negotiation phase and stand your ground and say, this is what, how we can adjust that price. Now, many of you might be familiar with CALP. CALP is technically acceptable lowest price. And the way this works is that you get a stack of proposals that are technical, no price, and a stack that have a price, all the prices. You go through the technical and, the, and all the ones that pass muster are the ones that are left. And then whoever has the lowest price proposal gets the business, period. There, there, there's no other decision. If it's a TALP, and many of the government stuff you deal with especially are TALP, um, be aware that, that it is an extremely price-driven uh, process. It is price-driven. Is it procurement driven? Most of the abominations I deal with in, in RFPs are usually when procurement takes over and the FM has lost control of that process or had uh, given some input, but it, it didn't ever translate it through to the final documents. Um, if it's procurement driven, realize you're going to have to speak the language of procurement, which is, did you check the boxes uh, that you were supposed to check? And I know I'm simplifying that, but, but uh, really, if you know this is procurement driven, give procurement exactly what they want, when they want it, how they want it. Make it simple. Don't, don't, no fluff. But try to give that FM flexibility to override uh, that decision uh, by giving them lots of value adds. If you lose it, ask the client for a debrief. Say, hey, um, what were the deciding factors? And they might not give you the debrief. In the government, they, they tend to give you that. Um, but, uh, you know, ask. You never know. Ask how could we improve. Be take take it. Say yeah, your proposal was awful, <laughs> um, or you know it's too long, or or didn't answer the questions we wanted. Uh, who was the awardee? They might not tell you, but they might. It's important to know. Um, and and then do an internal review, review and debrief with your team. How could we have improved? And then start the process over again. Make a plan for the next round. Do you know it's a three year contract? Start working it to get, to be on the on the you know the slate the next time around. And then lastly, for award, there's a few different kinds. There's a sign and go. Hey, you won. Let's do it. <laughs> I, like, I like the response. Those are great, right? But then there's usually the negotiation. Hey, we like you. We're choosing you. But we're wondering if you can change A, B, and C, and how much would that be? Okay, they get those, which would result in a change order. You see those a lot. Um, so it, knowing that might happen sometimes, too, in an RFP, as you say, well, I'm going to price exactly what they want. And then when they come back and say, yeah, we want you, but we want to change these things, um, and, and it's going to be an increase in cost, you know, realize that that might be your opportunity to change that, that price. And then what's your startup mobilization plan to begin that? So some, there, there might be a, 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 some of these might not be a win today, start tomorrow. It might be a win today, start in 90 days because there's a, a mobilization period. So that's the kind of flyover. So you kind of see what we deal with as vendors. That should help you in, uh, as you design your RFPs to make them more user-friendly to get back apples to apples instead of apples to helicopter pricing. So, so with that, I'd just like to open it up to any questions for, for Larry or, or, or me uh, in any ways that we can offer advice or help. Yeah, we had a couple questions come in. And someone was asking if a recording of this webinar will be posted. And yes, it will be posted at the CFC website, which is ifmacfc.org. So I encourage everyone to go there and look at other um, archived webinars they have. Another um, question we have is, what resources would you recommend to FMs to reference for sample of well-written RFPs? Wow. Um, that's, a, that's, that's kind of a catch question because there's – hundreds of really great RFPs. Um, whoever is asking that question, if you want to send me an email at larry.morgan at sap.com, um, let me try and tackle that on a one-off situation because there's there's multiple different RFPs that I use that are performance-based, one for cleaning, one for uh, landscaping, one for HVAC maintenance, et cetera. So maybe I can help um, independently here. Okay, great, thank you. And just a reminder to everyone, if you do have a question, please type it into the question box, and I'll be happy to present it to Larry and Wayne. We'll give you just an extra moment, and we're waiting to see if anyone else has any remaining um, webinars, excuse me, any questions? 
Joshua, I would I would like to add to what, what Larry said uh, that your your subject matter expert uh, vendor partners are also a great resource to help you with writing scope uh, as well. So if you do a, a pre RFI and bring in a few vendor subject matter experts and just ask, how would you procure the service if you were me? What would you do? What questions would you ask? And and you know see what they say and gather that information. How, what framework would you use? Would you use a, the, the per square foot here? Would you use this or whatever? Um, ask us. Um, we can help and and uh, and help you get a better turnout. Yeah, let me add on to that too. Um, another resource that we often kind of glance over is the IFMA Knowledge uh, Library. So uh, whoever's asking that question, or if there's any other questions from the audience. Um, you may want to go to the IPMA Knowledge Library and search for RFPs or prescriptive performance, whatever that is. Um, I'm sure that there's something in there that can help guide you. Excellent. And I do want to remind everyone that next month's webinar will be Managing Risk and Delivering Facility Services on September 5th. Um, that announcement should be coming out shortly. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions coming through. So um, if you do come up with any questions later on, oh wait, someone just came in. Oh wait, this is talking about generic RFPs. Okay, same question. Um, so if you do have any questions, please feel free to reach out to Larry or Wayne. They'd be happy to help you and answer any questions you may have. And as you said, it was Larry.Morgan at SAP. And Wayne, what's your email address? It's Wayne W at DFS green.com excellent okay i'm going to go ahead and close it here i want to thank everyone for attending and wayne and larry thank you for a very informative webinar Have great, a great thanks day. everybody take care thank you